their lives were really put on pause. They were scared. Students adjusting to a post-pandemic landscape. You can see the, the class size are getting bigger and bigger, and it's just kind of nerve-wracking. Schools grappling with changing enrollment. We went from very few uh, kids of color in Bellevue, when I was even a student, to we're now a majority minority school district. And trying to keep kids safe as the dangers of fentanyl and a mental health crisis loom. Sometimes kids just need to know someone's watching. Since the pandemic, public schools in Washington have lost 60,000 students. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kristen Goodwillie. This is a special King 5 presentation into the state of education in Washington. Many families have chosen other types of schooling, but a lot of kids remain missing from the records altogether. King 5's Jessica Janner Castro asks, where did these students go? Before the pandemic, do we need a new school? Yeah. Every day started with a morning rush. All right, hey guys. To public school. Okay, let's come to the table. Now the commute is short. Get talking about whales again. Just to the dining room. Where did my book go? For homeschooling. Harpoons. Teaching your own kids may sound tough. We're used. But for Jennifer McLucas of Vancouver, Washington. To get to the whale. It was a better option than juggling distance learning. It was extremely difficult. I had a child in middle school and um, a child in high school and, uh, and two kids in elementary school and trying to coordinate their Zoom times and connect with their teachers and you know to find out what we needed to do. It was just it was really overwhelming for me. That's when the McLucas family tried homeschool. And at the time I was looking for anything that would bring some peace to our home and um, uh, and it, it really worked for us. It's not just the McLucas family here in Vancouver. Families across Washington have decided to leave public for private and homeschool options. Looking at pre pandemic state data compared to the latest numbers, private school enrollment has gone up 17%, homeschool even more at 43%. What's going on here is really straightforward. Uh, parents of really young children. Uh, didn't want to sit them in front of a computer all day. And in particular, at the kindergarten level, where often that choice is optional. Thomas D. at Stanford University recently led a team analyzing data across the country. One of the most striking effects of the pandemic was a, a, an historically unprecedented exodus from public schools. According to state records, since the pandemic, the five largest school districts in the state all have dips in enrollment. Seattle fell by 8%, Lake Washington dropped 3%, Spokane and Tacoma fell by 6%, Kent fell by 7 I think that one's pretty good. The biggest changes happened in the elementary schools. I have a question. Yes. When's lunch? In just a little bit. For the McLucas family, it's made sense to homeschool, even beyond the early grades. Most of the people in our neighborhood here actually homeschooled in 2020, um, but when schools opened back up, their kids uh, just went back to school, however they were schooling before. And um, I think that's great. It, um, for us, this was a better option. The Stanford study also showed thousands of kids fell off the books that couldn't be explained by a switch to private or homeschool or moving out of state. In Washington, his team found more than 10,000 students were simply missing. Some kids might be truant. They're just not in school. They've dropped out, aren't attending, etc. Two, they might be enrolled in homeschooling, but they haven't informed the state. So there might be unregistered homeschool. And I like hanging out with you. And I like hanging out with you too. That's exactly the case for the youngest McLucas, Jane, who's six. It's not easy. No, school is not easy when yeah. this happens. In Washington, you don't have to send your child to school until age eight. So Jane's mom has no obligation to register Jane as a homeschooler for two more years. Yeah. It's cool on dog day. Cool on dog day. It is hard to track the movements of families who homeschool if they don't report. Chris Rakedahl is the superintendent of public instruction. I keep saying to folks, 
no one lost children in this process. <laughs> what we lost are the data around the enrollments and where they landed. And most of the gap that we you know, don't have a hard number for, it's because they're in homeschool models. I think we should get the morning corn dogs. Yeah. Clark, a sophomore interested in architecture, says homeschool has been much better for him. I'm going to be completely honest. I did not get stuff done in public school. It helps me learn the things that I want to learn that um, help me with what I think I'm supposed to do with my life. It's totally flexible. I think people are learning that there's there's just there's more than one way to to make things work for your family. And I think that that's really that's really good. It's there's a lot of freedom there. A freedom they stumbled upon when the world closed down. That's become their new normal. I definitely would not have tried it if it had not been for the pandemic. And I think that that first year was definitely empowering, um, not just for me, but I think for the kids too. All right, math and English, guys. The opposite is happening in rural areas. The number of students in those classrooms is increasing as families leave urban centers in search of more affordable housing. King 5's Lionel Donovan went to Ording to learn more about how its school district is preparing for the city's growing population. It's back to school season in Pierce County. And Jenny McKinney says she's glad her kids are in the Ording School District. I love that. Community feel. She moved to the area from Kirkland five years ago and says one of the main draws was the small town charm. Really small so the kids can get to know the teachers better. I also found out that the majority of the staff live in Ording or in the surrounding areas, so they're really invested. You can actually see the principal at the Safeway in town or you can run into your kindergarten teacher getting ice cream. But Jenny says she's starting to notice that the small town she moved to is growing faster than she's comfortable with as people from Seattle and Tacoma move in. You can see the, the class size are getting bigger and bigger and it's just kind of nerve wracking. Census data shows that Ording's population grew by nearly 75 percent between 2010 and 2020. We're a busting at the seams. Now the Ording School District is trying to figure out how to grow as well. This is the city corridor right here. Superintendent Ed Hatzenbiller says the trick is to follow where housing is being built and a lot of it is going up in Ording. But we're staring at a little over 5,000 homes over the next 12 years so by 2035 and that will about double the size potentially of our district. So we think we could be anywhere by 2032 of twin, uh, I'll say about 4,400 kids up to a little over 5,000, maybe 5,200. Hatson Beeler says finding space for that many students will be difficult for a school district that's already struggling with cramped classrooms. Three of the district's four schools are currently over capacity. Hatson Beeler says earlier this year, a $150 million bond measure would have secured funding for a new school building but voters rejected it. And 2023 was the worst year in the last 25 years for school bonds across the state. Just 8% of those school bonds passed. Hatson Beeler says he understands the hesitation to support the bond as people try to make ends meet, but says in the near future, the district won't have any more space for new students and new schools are vital. Meanwhile, Jenny hopes other voters come on board. I have the faith that Ording takes care of Ording, and I feel that it will come soon. Lionel Donovan, King 5 News. It's been almost a year since the COVID public health emergency ended here in Washington, but students are still trying to catch up after campus closures and online learning. This year, the Tumwater School District is mixing things up in middle school. Here's King 5's Drew Mickelson. All right, my name is Amy. I work at Pacific Shellfish Institute, so I study shellfish. Think of it as a field trip, but instead of heading out, the science comes to the students. That's weird. Today's lesson, plankton. Both middle schools in Tumwater. Yeah, I spotted a few plankton. Now partner with nonprofits who don't charge the district for the visits, allowing for more hands-on lab work. Things are swimming. Traditional models call for lectures and reading up on a subject before ever doing any experiments. The reason why that's so powerful is that's actually what real science is. You're, they're actually practicing being scientists. The other thing is, it's just a lot more fun. Teacher Jason Roberts gave all his students teddy bears during the first week of school. They had two feet of masking tape. They had 10 pieces of paper. They had to make the tallest chair that they could that would support their bear. He says this generation needs support too. He still sees COVID's impact educationally 
and emotionally. Some of the rough house, the playing and stuff that you would you would see out on the on the playground at recess in elementary school. We're seeing that in the hallways here at the middle school. Their lives were really put on pause. They were scared. Michelle Paul heads up the new curriculum and the summer school courses that emphasize potential career education like drone piloting, anything to find ways to get students engaged. And it is a best practice to do this kind of work, but I think COVID did push us to really jump in because we knew kids needed more. It's way more fun than reading a book. I know that much for sure. Bella Lincoln just started sixth grade. And she likes this kind of school much more than any online learning. I think it's like probably the best that we could get because it's really fun to do and then we, instead of like just reading about it we actually get to see it in person. Drew Mingles, mm. King 5 News. The stress of the pandemic is just one of the factors contributing to a nationwide teacher shortage. While recruiting for the upcoming school year, some districts are looking toward the future and hoping to create a cycle of teachers coming on board. Being a first generation student in college, my dad is very proud. Hablas Espanol? Sí. Proud. As she walks on the Pacific Lutheran University and campus, Lillian Garibay's ready to start her freshman year. She's here thanks to Seed Teachers, a new collaborative program allowing Tacoma High School grads like Lillian to earn a college degree and teaching credential debt free. The bonus? What is my equation? Hiring these new teachers back into Tacoma public schools. I've never been offered like the opportunity to be myself. Being Hispanic, it's been difficult to step out of my comfort zone in a classroom. About 23% of Tacoma's students are Hispanic, but the majority of teachers, 80%, are white. Helping change teacher diversity is just part of Lillian's focus. I feel like as a student, being offered a safe place and a place to show yourself and learn in a safe community, I feel like I could offer my students that by sharing my culture and my language in a different form. Increasing diversity while adding a rolling number of candidates, a strategy in place as Washington teacher attrition and turnover is at an all time high. In 2022, the teacher attrition rate was 8.91%, the highest in the previous 37 years. Turnover is also high at 19.76%. This according to an analysis of Washington State data by Calder Center. Leaders right in now. education know this is a crucial time. One of the lead drivers of um, teachers leaving the profession is not having the knowledge and skills to be effective in their role. So high quality preparation is essential to teachers staying and feeling like they can make a difference. All aiming to make that difference are SEED teachers partners, Pacific Lutheran, Tacoma Public Schools and nonprofit Degrees of Change. Lillian's already thinking about her future students. And I think having joined a classroom and at least a little fun in a classroom would bring students back in. Lillian is a part of Tacoma's long term outlook. This year, seed teachers will support about 20 students to become teachers, then return to their hometown district. In five years, a cycle of 100 new teachers is in motion. I think that this program changed me completely. In Bellevue, administrators hope to honor the city's heritage in the classroom. And for the district's new superintendent, it's personal. I feel that connection in any of the Bellevue schools that I walk through. Dr. Kelly Aramaki knows Bellevue likely better than any other superintendent that's come before him. His family's roots in this community run deep. That's me when I was five years old. Born and raised in Bellevue, Aramaki graduated from Newport High. His dad is a Sammamish High grad. This is my grandfather, Akira. And his grandfather graduated from Bellevue High School in 1931. He was on the basketball team, the baseball team. He was part of the senior class theater. The Aramakis are one of the first Japanese American families in Bellevue, starting with his great grandfather, who immigrated here in 1900. He came here looking for a better opportunity, just like so many people. He ended up starting a farm under my grandfather's name because at that time, um, people who were from Japan couldn't own land. But in 1942, during World War II, the Aramakis had to abandon their farm and were forced into incarceration camps. My grandfather didn't talk a whole lot about it. You know, it was, um, I think most of the Japanese Americans who came back after World War II didn't talk a lot about history. So it was, you know, there's just kind of this sense of like, we're not gonna talk about it. We're just gonna keep our heads down, work hard. It was the first time I'd learned anything about it was um, 
after college in, during my master's program. It's one of the reasons Aramaki is so passionate about curriculum that includes Bellevue's history. If we don't talk about the Japanese Americans when we teach about Bellevue history, then my family is completely erased from the history of Bellevue. As the first permanent Asian American superintendent in the district, where 104 different languages are spoken, Aramaki's goal is to give students a sense of belonging, where their culture and heritage is honored. The diversity in Bellevue has changed a lot. We went from very few uh, kids of color in Bellevue, when I was even a student, to we're now a majority minority school district. But he's stepping into a role with a lot of challenges. As a superintendent, but also as a dad of a teenager, I, I am, I mean, fentanyl is something um, that is top of mind for all of us. Like opioid overdoses among teenagers, budget cuts forcing the consolidation of elementary schools, and helping students with their mental health and wellness. I'm so happy to come to work. Aramaki, whose 23-year career in education includes teaching and administration, says leading the district in his hometown is not only a dream come true, it's significant for his entire family. I do feel like, you know, going from Japanese internment to being the superintendent of the, the school district, you know, is a it's, it's an amazing story for my family, for the Japanese American community. One of the other consequences of changing enrollment is funding. Even after sweeping changes in 2017, there's still controversy surrounding how we pay for schools. So we looked into how it works and how we got here. King 5 senior producer Josh Flug and anchor Christine Pay show us. Let's follow the money for where your school gets its money in three parts. How we got here, the model we use now, and the problems left to hammer out. It starts with a state constitution which clearly states it is a paramount duty of the state to make ample provision for the education of all children, regardless of race, color, caste, or sex. Ample means not just adequate, considerably more than just adequate. That's Tom Ahern, an attorney whose lawsuit redefined education in Washington. For decades, schools complained they were underfunded, filling the gaps with local tax dollars. An inequitable system where property-rich districts get a better education and poor districts get a worse one. That argument makes sense if... Ahern represented two families and a consortium of school leaders accusing the state of failing its constitutional obligation. At the top of that lawsuit, the McCleary's. I'm hoping that the um, Supreme Court realizes that we're running out of time and that we need action now, today. Stephanie McCleary's son was in the second grade when this all started. I went to his high school graduation before the case was over. <laughs> That's how long this dragged on. But they'd go all the way to the state Supreme Court and win. It becomes known as 2012's McCleary decision, and it says the state wasn't doing its job. The court fined Washington $100,000 every day for more than five years until it could come up with a plan to stop underpaying teachers, allowing classes to become too big and relying too much on levies to fund schools on the local level. Our Constitution places a high, high premium on equality in that sense and equity. Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos heads the Education Committee in Olympia. The court basically said when you have a school district that's doing that, then the state is shirking its duty because there's nothing more basic than having a qualified teacher in every classroom. In 2017, the state came up with a new formula that poured billions of dollars of new funding into education, which put a halt on the McCleary fines. Here are the broad strokes. The formula sets standards for what sort of resources every school should get, then ties funding to their enrollment. So the more students you have, the more money you get. After McCleary, school districts must report to the state how they are spending state dollars. But at the end of the day, we send the money out. The way it gets spent is totally within the discretion of the local jurisdiction. Number 11. Everyone gets enough to fund their schools, and districts still get to decide how to run their schools in theory. So does it work? State educators say this system is better than what it used to be. Pre-McCleary, it was, it was always a struggle. It felt like we were always trying to keep our head 
just barely above water. Teacher salaries have risen to become the fifth highest on average of any state in the country. According to U.S. Census data, Washington is among the top 20 states for spending per kid. But union representatives say schools are still short funds for transportation, paraeducators, and federally mandated special education services. They have to use local dollars or state dollars in order to cover the, the requirement in special ed for that one-to-one -one para. That gets really, really expensive quickly. Declining enrollment is forcing schools to make tough decisions under this model, like consolidating schools in Bellevue. To close a school is shocking for a community. It's hard to recover. And a post-COVID world has state lawmakers asking if the state's current formula is in fact the best way to serve our kids. We know that learning can take place anytime, anywhere. And so how do we measure whether or not our students are learning? School districts can still use local tax dollars to a point to fund extra programs or activities known as enrichment. In the last biennial budget, the state marked more than $27 billion for education spending. That's over half of its budget. The dollar amount went up in the next budget by another billion, but the percentage of the state budget dedicated to education dropped from 51% down to just under 48%. Teachers and parents are facing new challenges to keep kids safe, both physically and emotionally. The FBI says the number of school threats is increasing and creating a significant problem for law enforcement agencies. Even if a threat is fake, it's always treated as real until proven otherwise, and that can pull resources away. That's a problem for local law enforcement departments who have to investigate school threats with already minimal resources. Our local partners are already shorthanded and understaffed, and so addressing hoax just takes more resources away from that, and, and the community has seen that. The FBI is also asking the community to always report a threat, even if you think it may be fake, and asking parents to educate kids about using social media responsibly. You don't want to be the person that says, oh my gosh, I, I saw that and I didn't take it seriously because that's a heavy, a heavy weight to bear. This year, Seattle Public Schools is implementing some changes to encourage safety. I spoke with students to see how they're feeling about these new policies. This is generational trauma. Thinking about safe learning is hard for an entire generation that has grown up with active school shooter drills. It's kind of just been, oh, okay, when's the next shooting? Who's dying next? Where is it happening? And hoping it's not at your school, which isn't a healthy mindset at all <laughs> when you're just trying to learn. Nor Goldberg and Natalia McConnell are starting their senior year of high school. It can be intimidating going back to school after it's felt so unsafe in the past couple years. Um, and it's really unfortunate that it had to take students dying on local campuses for us to be able to actually make change happen. In November, 17-year-old Ebenezer Hale was shot and killed at Ingram High School. Shortly after, McConnell organized a massive walkout through the Seattle Student Union, demanding mental health resources in schools and stricter gun laws. We were able to win $4 million for school mental health counselors. The school board passed the SPS Safety Initiative, which includes a safety review of campuses, creating community action teams, and a mental health council. In addition, the school district is implementing these safety improvements for the fall semester. That includes campus signage, locks that activate from inside a classroom, and an app for high schoolers to report threats. These small steps of signage, of door locks, um, are okay, but they are not going to prevent a school shooting as much as school mental health counselors are and gun control is. That's why the student union says they're advocating for $20 million to go towards mental health counselors in the next city council budget. We're kids and we're just fighting every step of the way trying to be able to just get an education without risking our lives. The U.S. Surgeon General suggests we are in the middle of a youth mental health crisis. King 5's Maddie White learned what Tacoma Public Schools is doing to support kids' mental health this school year. And I always say kids vote with their feet. And vote with their feet they did. A thousand kids actually showed up and had a safe summer. And that, she says, is a success since they could have chosen to be anywhere and they chose to come and show up at our schools and play basketball with their friends. This summer, Tacoma campuses hosted a new program called Summer Late Nights. Creating the spaces where kids can be safe. The goal? Boost kids' mental health and well-being.
because broader statistics in Pierce County lately have been alarming. Those statistics are scary and, and sad, especially when it comes to crime. In January of this year, the Pierce County prosecuting attorney says they handled 53 juvenile cases. That number last year was 34. So to find the percent increase, we find the difference between the two numbers. Divide that by the original number and it gives us 0.558, which means there was a nearly 56% increase between this year and last. This considered. We had kids that were having, you know, issues. Are public schools able to meet the growing need for youth mental health support? The below enrollment means less funding, which means it's harder for us to do all the things we need to do. So they're getting creative. Thanks to a multi-year grant they applied for and won. That allowed us to um, do contracts with outside um, agencies to provide long term care. They're bringing therapists directly to the classroom in some cases when an issue has been identified. So there's not that gap in care of like we sent home a referral and then the parent had to go do 25 steps to get to it. She says they recently did a group therapy session with students involved in violence on a campus. Sometimes kids just need to know if someone's watching. Maddie White, King 5 News. Also, in relation to students' health, fentanyl is creating a new level of fear for parents. Overdoses from the drug are rising across our state. According to the state superintendent's office, Narcan was used twice in schools in 2021 and six times in 2022. During the 2022-2023 school year, Narcan was administered 42 times, according to a survey. State law requires schools with 2,000 students or more to have Narcan on hand. But there is nothing requiring schools to teach students about the dangers of fentanyl. I think it's super important that parents sit down and just say, we need you know, to have this conversation as uncomfortable as it is, because you don't want a dead kid. More schools are now asking the DEA for presentations for students about the dangers of fentanyl. A big focus this school year is the use of artificial intelligence. Over in the Seattle Public School District, administrators are cracking down worried about cheating. Last year, the district blocked a software called ChatGPT on all student devices. King 5's Maddie White spoke with teachers on how they're preparing. I was cheating on my math test, yeah. One high school senior was an open book when it came to how he once used AI on his computer while taking a math test. I wanted to pass it. It was my final for that class. And the principal walked up behind me. She saw his screen. His heart dropped. But she was just like, oh, you're using AI. Cool. Like she didn't think anything of it because I think teachers now are using it as a tool. It's a mixed bag with how people feel about it. I ended up passing the class. But I'm told it's used for more than just passing a test. But I've also seen people use it to write essays and things like that. Here is how it works. The idea behind ChatGPT is essentially you can have it generate a human-like answer for anything you want. For example, you could have it write a five-paragraph essay about Catcher in the Rye, a book you might be familiar with, and boom, there it goes. Those middle three paragraphs and a conclusion as well. One Seattle public school parent is preparing to have conversations with her daughter about it. She will use any of these tools with some oversight from us. She says it's neither good nor bad, just different. But it's actually brought a lot of good discussions to the forefront. Even in the age of AI, there's still a place for good old fashioned school supplies like notebooks and pencils. King 5's Jake Wittenberg and Mimi Jung take a shopping trip to see what it might cost to outfit an elementary school student for class. All right, before we get started, mm. I think we should make this a competition. Let's see who can guess the closest with the items on this list. Okay, so we have 13 items on this list. I will try to determine how much it's gonna cost and you will too and we'll see who wins. I think it's gonna be <clears throat> I'm thinking $68.75. All right, the kids at Cedar Valley need dry erase markers. And an eraser. And an eraser, okay. all right. Notebook. Oh, here we go. Oh no. <laughs> I may have underestimated how much this costs. Wow, okay. Colored pencils. Ooh, do we get the 12 or do we get the 24? Did it specify? 12. 12, okay, here we go. Ooh, 99 cents. 
Uh, we need one box of washable markers. Any of these. And then we need probably crayons. I gotta have crayons. It says chisel tipped highlighters. There's a difference. Chisel Just tip. Narrow chisel. Narrow chisel. Uh -huh. narrow chisel. Uh -huh. All right. Pencil sharpener. Okay, we need those eraser tops, the things that I never could get to work. They always fell off my pencil. Did that happen to you? Mm -hmm. Three, four, five. You're very organized. Yes, I am. <laughs> four ninety nine. Two. Oh, uh, we got the markers. Mm -hmm. We've got the colored pencils, the eraser, yep. pair of scissors, yep. and the glue sticks. All right, let's check. Let's check out. Okay. How much do you think all of these supplies cost? So, well, I, my original guess was about sixty-eight dollars. Sixty-eight? What did you say? Thirty-one. <laughs> I think it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. Twenty-seven. Wow, you were really close. Nicely done. Sixty-eight. I overestimated a little bit. Yeah, I think we did well. School supplies are more expensive than ever. That final tally of $27 is actually 35% more expensive than it was five years ago. According to advertising from Target, the total would have been closer to $20. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kristen Goodwillie.